Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Explore More, Bark Less, Exercising Your Reactive Dog. My name is Caitlin Thomas and I am your presenter for today's lecture and Kate Wilson is the co-creator of this lecture series. So the first thing that we're going to talk about in this lecture is what is exercise? So depending on where you're um, pulling your definition from, there are many different definitions, but some of the common trends that we see here are bodily or mentally exertion, specifically for the sake of improving health, happiness, or wellness. Those are kind of some of the common things that we see among all definitions, or a behavior or skill that is practiced in order for a means, um, or, or is um, done for a means of practicing or for training. So something like practicing the piano, um, or, or physical exertion such as running or um, swimming maybe for the sake of practicing a skill um, and improving health, happiness, and wellness along the way. So the next thing that I wanna talk about is what is stress? So what is the definition of stress? So stress is ultimately something that's used to keep us learning alive and functioning safely in our worlds. So it could be quote, good stress, or we call, what we call you stress, or bad stress. So both of these two things aid in survival, but no matter which it is, it's our body's reaction to essentially a change in the environment that requires the body to note or adjust to that change. So it could be quote, good or bad, but both of them are, um, are helping us survive. So those things might come from inside the body. So something like a thought process, maybe a chemical change inside the body, or externally. So something environmental happens, maybe, um, you know, like an example would be um, like a dog sees a person come up and it elicits a little bit of stress. So that's what's considered outside input from the outside world. So when we're talking about these stressors, we're going to, we're going to be looking mostly at the quote bad stress. And I don't really like to think of it as quote bad stress because it's all meant to help serve a purpose for us or it all serves a purpose for us, which is to help keep us living and processing and moving in our world safely. But the quote good stress or you stress is something that we experience say when maybe we win the lottery. So that's very stressful, but it's considered quote good stress or getting a promotion, getting a new house, um, that might also be, quote, bad stress, depending on how we're looking at it. But our bad stress is going to be something such as um, maybe we don't get a promotion or maybe we get um, reprimanded at work or we forgot our lunch at home and it brings up a little bit of stress or maybe we're experiencing um, trouble with our reactive dog and that elicits a little bit of, quote, bad stress. So either way, no matter which way we're looking at it, they're both aiding in survival and helping us kind of get through the world and navigate the world safely. For today's purposes, we're mostly going to talk about the quote bad stress or stress on the system. So what does stress look like? So when we're looking at this, I want you to kind of be thinking about what does stress look like when you're experiencing that quote bad stress. So this is often a chemical reaction in the body. And what it's meant to do is give the body fuel that it needs for self-protection or to protect itself from potentially harmful, scary, or life-threatening situations. When we're talking about this, we want to always make sure that we remember that this might be a quote, real threat. So say your dog has been um, bitten by an off-leash dog or has been attacked by a dog or has been maybe, um, I don't know, a person reached down and grabbed your dog really quickly. And so your dog is experiencing stress around those triggers. Those are real stressors for your dog. The dog has a history of um, sort of their, their survival being at stake from those scenarios or those, those stimuli in the environment coming up. Or it might be just a perceived threat where your dog isn't sure um, or, or hasn't had a bad experience with that stressor, but they believe it to be a threat to their safety. So for me, it might be um, spiders, right? It might be a spider that's going to cause me no harm, that is going to stay away from me, that is not poisonous or um, is not going to bite, but I believe that it is something that is a threat to my survival. So my body has that same stress response that it would if say it was a scorpion who I had a bad experience with at one point. So no matter which way we're looking at it, we're just remembering that these are both real and perceived, and it's really up to our dog to decide 
um, what's stressful and what's not. When we see that stress, some of the things that we might see is the heart rate increases, we might see breathing become heavier or quicken. So for a lot of our reactive dogs, what that might look like is they're out on a walk and maybe they're walking and their mouth is open and then all of a sudden they see a, a dog or they hear a sound and their mouth closes and they start, you know, their heart rate starts to increase a little bit. They start to get a little bit puffy in the cheeks, their lips puff out a little bit, that air is flowing, but their mouth is staying closed. So you can kind of see that, you know, starting to come out from under their lips. Their muscles might tense up. So you might see that's where you get that full body where all the muscles tense up in the front of the body or all throughout maybe the rib cage and their back end. You see kind of um, as a byproduct of that, some of that prancy behavior where they're starting to walk on their tippy toes a little bit. Their body's so tense that you're no longer seeing that really soft fluid motion. We might see hypervigilance or the dog is walking and they're quickly looking side to side. Their pupils might be dilated a little bit, but they're not really able to relax. They're just kind of looking around for any trigger that's gonna come out at any given moment. You might see a rise in blood pressure, um, which is something that we might not actually physically see, but it's just a physiological response happening inside of the body. And why is this happening? The body is now prepared for fight or flight. So here we are, this is what the, the purpose of all of these things are, is the system is now prepped to be able to defend itself in the face of this trigger. So again, we're just remembering, it might be a real threat or a perceived threat, but to our dog, they're processing it the same way physiologically and stress-wise. The effects of chronic stress on the system, this is something that I just want everyone to think about. So for the dogs maybe who are experiencing this type of stress every day, maybe they have a dog walker or they go out and they're um, having to go maybe for a walk in the neighborhood every day or in and out of their car and you're having these stressors constantly come up where every day the dog is experiencing something like this or even weekly or monthly sometimes it can have the same effect we'll see an increase in stress level overall an increase in reactivity or other quote behavior issues we think of kind of what what happens and um just from an empathy perspective we're going to kind of talk a little bit about how this might affect humans though um, I wanna be really careful on that, that same note. Um, but one of the things, think of what would happen if you were under chronic stress at work, what that does to other behaviors in your world or how that affects other behaviors or um, your emotional state. So you might be a little bit more irritable or a little bit faster to respond to something that you might not otherwise if you weren't under that type of chronic stress. So when we say an increase in quote behavior issues, that's often what we're, what we're seeing too on our end from our dog's perspective is we're seeing these other issues sort of pop up because that dog is under um, an immense amount of stress. And again, it could be as simple as just a five minute walk every day is bringing that dog to the point where they're having this response to other things in their environment that might be a little bit more kind of um, edgy than it would be if we didn't have that stress. The increase in reactivity, what often happens is as our dogs start to practice this reactivity or their systems start to be prepped to respond to these things in their environment is we see that the body starts preparing a little bit ahead of time and that's a survival tactic. So we think if, you know, if we were living in an environment where say there were bears living right outside and every time we walked outside, we had to be prepared just in case to run or to fight off a bear before you go to go outside, you might start prepping a little bit, you know, emotionally to get ready because that would aid in survival for you. So if it caught you off guard every single time, that wouldn't necessarily be something that would keep you alive. If your system was a little bit prepared, that might be something where if you have those, um, if you kind of have your body ready to go ahead of time, you might have that response faster, which would then aid in survival. As we see those behaviors start to pop up a little bit more, we see that reactivity start to kind of take over so that that dog can survive. So maybe they're going from window to window when they see dogs walk by and all of a sudden all they're doing is sitting and watching out the window or sitting and looking out the front door waiting for a trigger to pass by. Those behaviors start to kind of take over all of the natural behaviors that might be happening in that environment. So we might see that dogs are less playful with their toys or they're sometimes unable to eat 
or we'll give them something to play with that's new and all they can do is still look out the window or they're pacing back and forth or or they're eating but then all of a sudden they hear one thing and they just shoot up and it pulls them out of that natural behavior and brings them over to that reactivity again another natural behavior for survival but we're seeing kind of those quote healthy behaviors start to diminish as that reactivity starts to increase so again our system is starting to learn to be prepared as a natural state of being as opposed to having kind of that natural relaxed um, state of being as our default inability to settle around the time of day that the outings happen this is a really big one so think of what happens for your dogs if you feed your dog the same time every day at 6 p.m or you talk to someone that does they will tell you that about 5 30 the dog starts displaying behavior that says that they're excited for food or the meal time that's about to happen it's a really interesting and kind of fun phenomenon that happens where the dogs will start to prepare for what's going to happen the same time every day in the same way that we do so the same thing happens for our dogs that are struggling reactivity with reactivity, except one is our kind of quote, good stress, and the other is our quote, bad stress. So the system might start preparing for those outings before the outings actually happen. So if we walk our dogs the same time every day, we might see that prior to that, and, and again, the length of time that the dog starts preparing is sort of up to the individual dog, sometimes it's minutes sometimes it's hours so i've seen dogs that are preparing for that walk kind of emotionally hours and hours beforehand and people will report you know the dog has a hard time settling they have a hard time relaxing in the house they have a hard time sleeping and again it's kind of a culmination of all of those things happening at once frustration for the dog and guardian when we're talking about reactivity I want everyone to sort of remember that this is not just about your dog, it's also about you or the person that is living with that dog. So when we think of frustration increasing for the dog or, or our kind of, if, if we're constantly frustrated with our dog, what that might do to our relationship with them. So if we're always sort of struggling to get through or we're struggling to get by or we're always experiencing this stress with the dog, it can be really damaging to our relationship with the dog and our frustration can often increase kind of in the same way it would if there was another constant, you know, quote, annoyance in our lives. It's not that we don't love our dogs or we don't care about them deeply and dearly, but when we're always having to sort of um, mitigate damage or, or kind of get our dog to stop reacting or pulling our dog away from things that they might be stressed for, it's hard to be sort of the caretaker of that dog. So when our dogs are, are chronically stressed, often we see that the humans are also chronically stressed. Um, decrease in lifespan, we know that, that the higher stress levels are, then kind of we start to see that lifespan kind of cut a little bit short. Increase in gastrointestinal issues, so we'll often see those dogs um, struggle with issues like diarrhea. They'll be stressed and they'll have maybe diarrhea. Sometimes we'll have um, different allergies. Like there's all sorts of things that can come from stress on the system. Serotonin lives um, kind of our feel good, happy hormones in our brain kind of lives in our gut. So it's really interesting when we're talking about our stress levels, what that does to our intestinal tract and on our, um, in our GI system. Decrease in cognitive function. We think the part of the brain that processes sort of um, logic and reasoning and learning new skills and working through problems is not really compatible or, or able to be fully online at the same time as the part of our brain that processes fight or flight. So as the fight or flight kicks on, then our other, you know, kind of our logical brain starts to kind of turn off a little bit so that that amygdala or that fight or flight or area of the brain can kind of take over because that's what's going to keep the dog alive. So we want the body responding as fast and as quick, kind of in as, um, as, uh, as quick as we possibly can so that that dog can stay alive. And then we see an increased risk of illness because we know that it also um, affects our immune system. So things to consider. Stressful outings also tire dogs out. So oftentimes people will say, oh my gosh, I have to exercise my dog because my dog will go crazy if I don't take them out. They're just going wild. They're running around the house. They're absolutely uncontrollable. We have nothing to do with them. And of course, remember, kind of think about all of those ways that when our dogs are kind of preparing for that stressor, of course, when we take our walk out, the system is prepped with all these stress hormones. And now what is it supposed to do? So if we cut our walks, if say the dog walks every single day at five o'clock, six o'clock, and then we cut the walk out, 
the dog is going to have a kind of a hard time with what to do there if there's just a blank void. So what we do is we then fill it with other exercises and other behaviors that are a little bit healthier and um, better for our dog and we'll get into that coming forward. But remember that stressful outings also tire dogs out. And my question to you would be why and what is the potentially long-term effects based on what we know already? So when we think about that, making kind of that, um, that leap a little bit in our heads of if you're running from something very, very scary to you, or you're in a place where you've got to fight something very scary to you, that's also going to make you tired. So it will tire you out, but it's a very, very, very different kind of tired than if you spend all day maybe hiking in a new place or riding your bike through maybe some trails. It's a very different kind of experience than it is dodging bullets. So running away from something and sort of having a really enriched experience in your world, those are very different types of tired at the end of the day. And remember that protecting yourself from perceived threats adds to your overall stress levels, not decreases them. So for the people that kind of say, I have to walk my dog, there are other options and we're gonna get into those coming forward. So just ask yourself, are walks for your dog stressful or are they exercise? So think about now that we know kind of the difference between what those things are, how are walks for your dog? Your body language will tell you and the dog's behavior will tell you. So if we look at the body language and say, do we have a really relaxed, really loose walk going on where our dog is sort of um, really, their muscles are soft and their ears are relaxed and their mouth is open and they're kind of trotting along like these two dogs here? Um, or are they stressed? Are they, are they in a state of stress where they're looking for triggers and having to protect themselves at any given moment? And if they are relaxed and a trigger pops up, does that elicit a big stress response? Because sometimes our dogs can be relaxed as they're walking and then just responding really intensely to those triggers. If you ask someone what it's like for them after a panic attack, they're going to tell you very, very, very exhausted. They're very exhausted after. So just remember when the dog gets home, just because they're tired doesn't necessarily mean that they were learning something that is useful for them or that they're having this really relaxed experience. So are your dogs dodging bullets or are, are they on a relaxing hike? And only you will know, but your body language and your behavior will tell you. So onto that, what is good for my dog? Remember the learner will tell you what's relaxing and fun. Our only job is to listen. So the learner or the student is the one that kind of tells us how they're experiencing various things. And all we have to do is listen to our dogs to let us know. It's really hard because a lot of times people want their dogs to enjoy walks. And if they don't enjoy things like walks or maybe the dog park or say they're getting reports from daycare that the dog is really over aroused and is really struggling and is really having a hard time maybe coming in and out of group or is nipping at dogs when they come in the door. It's really hard because a lot of times guardians want their dogs to be able to do certain things. And so there's this propensity to sort of push them towards those activities, even if they might not be ready, but just knowing and listening to your student or your dog, your learner, and saying, okay, how are you experiencing this? And is it what I want you to practice? And is it what I want you to learn is something that is important and will help bring you closer and help you help your dog. Options for exercising your reactive dog. Okay, let's jump in. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about in terms of exercising our reactive dogs are food puzzle toys. So these are things that will engage your dog's brain. These are two dogs, River and Nala, who are very, very mentally busy dogs. And so what we do with food puzzles is we just take various different puzzle toys and we put food inside of them. So what this does is it's gonna build confidence by rewarding and engaging them in new things. So just sort of think of like a novel environment when you go maybe to a new park or if you go on vacation and you experience different things that you've never experienced before, this is gonna kind of recreate that a little bit in puzzle form. So what this will do too is reward for constant effort of trying new things, which helps keep them going. So think of kind of what it's like when you're working on say a crossword puzzle 
how if you get one right and you're reinforced sort of by, and then it pushes you to do the next one and the next one and the next one, that's kind of what our dogs are experiencing when they have food puzzles, especially those food puzzles with multiple layers. When we're working on these, we want to make sure it's at our dog's level and not too high. So how you will know if it's too easy for your dog, your dog is just probably going to buzz right through it and be done in two seconds. If it's too hard for your dog, you might see things like barking at the object. You might see things like pawing excessively. You might see things like just chewing, kind of um, just chew, 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 but they're not really taking the time to calm down and think about what they're doing. Or you might see that the dog just gives up. So those are our signs that it might be too challenging or too easy. How you know that they're getting it right, again, imagine like you're working on a crossword puzzle. So you wanna sort of see thinking happening, you wanna kind of see that it's very deliberate, that it's very intentional, and that they're getting it right every time. If they're trying and failing and trying and failing and trying and failing, remember again the difference between our quote, good stress and bad stress, we want to make sure that they're really achieving sort of um, or they're reaching success every time they're practicing. Another thing that we can work on is food hunts and find it. So these are really fun. So what we do is we hide treats all around. There's multiple ways that we can do this. We can do it by putting treats all around our house, kind of on the floor where we just scatter our food all over the place and let the dog go search. Also, this is a really fun one to get kids involved with or a safe way to have children work with dogs. What we can do is we can put our dog away, maybe in their crate or a closed off area. We give the child maybe like 10 to 15 Dixie cups filled with different treats in it. So we can fill maybe just like a tiny little thing of treats, maybe a couple little jackpot treats. So maybe some string cheese or um, maybe a couple pieces of special treats they don't get very often. And then we put them inside those cups and we tell the child, okay, go hide them in places where the dog can find them. And so the child will go hide them all around the house. Again, I start with, I start with ways that are very easy for the dog. So they're pretty much in plain sight when I'm starting and I might even kind of follow the dog around and start helping point them out. And what we do is we just, as soon as all of the piles are set, we'll say the word, find it. And then we let the dog go and we kind of rush and and they go and they find it. They find all of the treats similar to like an Easter egg hunt. So they're gonna go search from pile to pile to pile. And as soon as they get all the piles, we just say the word all done, which tells them it's the kind of their signal for, you did it, you got them all, great job. As they're going to search, we're praising them and we're getting really excited. And then a way that we can add difficulty is once they're really masters at that, we can start putting the treats in harder places. So we might put them maybe inside of their toy, um, their toy bin, or maybe we put one just outside the front door, or we put one maybe on multiple uh, levels of the house so that that dog has to go high and low and up and down. And imagine how much physical and mental exercise that would give to our dogs. And that's sort of what we're trying to create here. We can also make it harder by putting food in the grass so what I'll do, once the dog is really skilled at this, I might take food and I might put it outside in the grass. Something else that's really fun, if we wanna combine our exercise one and our exercise two, is we can take a Kong wobbler, it's called, or maybe a puzzle toy. We can put dry food inside of it, and then we can put that in the grass. So then they have to wobble their wobbler all around. They, it's kind of like a bobblehead with food coming out of the side. There's a little hole. So they bobble it side to side. The food comes out. It goes all over the place. And then they have to then also find it in the grass, which recreates some of that foraging behavior that's, again, another natural healthy behavior. For our dogs that have a, kind of a hard time um, when they're in their backyard really enjoying their yard, I'll start by just taking them outside and giving them treats to help them kind of be calmer in that area. And then I might add in some exercises like this with some nice special treats hidden all around the grass or maybe um, something where they can start searching so that they're practicing a different behavior in the yard other than that reactivity. So again, we're reinforcing the behaviors that we like, which are those natural healthy behaviors, which means that those are gonna start to grow instead of our reactivity behaviors. 
Another thing we can work on is a flirt lure. This is actually um, not a picture of a flirt lure here. I think these photos got a little bit mixed up, but what the flirt lure is, is it's like a giant cat toy, but for dogs. So think of like a long stick with a string and then a toy on the end. So what I really like about these is for the people that just don't have a lot of time or they don't have a lot of um, maybe physical ability to exercise their dog really kind of um, intensely, what the Flirt Lure does is gives dogs an opportunity to practice some of this chasing and stalking in a healthy way. That's what we call, um, you know, kind of the, it's a modal action pattern that dogs have where they need to practice some of those behaviors and so if we don't give them really good outlets, they're going to find their own. And rarely do they find the ones that we want them to be practicing on. So what this does is it gives dogs an opportunity to practice that behavior, that chase behavior, just like our cats would with a little wand toy. So what I like to do is I like to teach dogs even how to sit and stay. And again, we wanna build these behaviors long before we start practicing on something like the flirt lure. So we want to make sure that the dog is able to already do those behaviors under high levels of distraction, because this is going to be a pretty hard one for our dogs. So the kind of our prerequisites before we start adding training onto this is a really good sit, a really good stay, and then a really good weight with distractions present. I also want to teach a release word like a free go okay, so that we can release that dog out of that position to chase. So what it looks like is I will have the dog in a sit and a stay, maybe waiting on a mat. I'll take that nice little flirt lure, or that, that toy, and I'll start moving it around and the dog stays and waits. And then I say, go or get it. And then the dog chases and then they chase it all around. And what that does is build some of that self-control around high distractions. A lot of that is going to bleed over when we're trying to get our dog to wait or to have some control when they see something exciting. And so that's what I really like about this is it kind of goes hand in hand with our reactivity. It can also be done in a yard or a driveway. Be careful at the driveway. Make sure your dog's paws are not getting torn up. Um, but it will also kind of help file those nails down a little bit if it is on concrete. But again, our, our caveat to that is watch their paw pads to make sure that that's safe. And we also want to be careful we're not whipping back and forth in a straight line because sometimes those quick sudden turns can cause some ACL tears or um, any, any sort of injuries for our dog. So we want to go in a nice big circle or fluid motion so that our dog isn't whipping back and forth. Another thing we can do is fetch. So this is a really fun game. Some of your dogs will like fetch. Some of your dogs will not be as interested in fetch. Fetch is a really great way to work a dog's body and brain. One of my cautions here is that excessive fetch or kind of that repetitive fetch over and over and over is not, is not really safe for our dogs physically or mentally. So for the dogs that just kind of are obsessive going back and forth playing with a ball over and over and over and over and over um, where they're playing fetch, when they come back to you, if they're having a really hard time, you know, they just drop it and then they're big in their eyes and they're waiting and waiting and waiting. That's something that can create a little bit of, um, that can be a little bit of a compulsion. And we want to make sure that we minimize some of that. And we try to get our dogs to the point where they're playing really relaxed and really calm and they're kind of in control so that they're practicing the behaviors that we want them to practice. And they're practicing them in the mental state that we'd like them to be in as their default. So another thing to think about is physically what it would do to a dog to play excessive fetch. And I know I'm, I'm cautioning first here, but physically it's very hard on our dogs we can see, we see a lot of injuries we see a lot of arthritis in those older dogs they'll start to become painful um, we just want to be really careful if they're rushing as fast as they can possibly go and then suddenly stopping really quickly and pouncing on something and then rushing back immediately that is really hard on their on their bodies and on their brains so just our little caution that if your dog is kind of excessively paying fetch this is probably not not um the game to choose until we get that under control a little bit. So again, something I like to do to kind of mitigate that is I work on increasing training. So I work on combining training. So the dog will be with me. I might start with maybe two balls. So the dog brings the ball back, they drop the ball, I say yes, and then I 
take a second ball out of my pocket and I toss that ball. So for the dogs that are having a hard time having their item picked up, so maybe they come back, they drop their ball, but then you go to grab it and they go after it really fast. I might take two balls, so I'm rotating them, or two toys that are identical, so that as they come, they drop their ball, we reduce the competition and we increase the cooperation just by adding that second item in. I might also, kind of to help them regulate a little bit, combine food into the equation, which can help kind of calm them down a little bit. So they come back, they bring the ball, they drop it. I might say yes, and I give them a treat. And then I take the ball out of my pocket and then I toss that one once they're done swallowing. So I want to basically start working a little bit on training there, getting them to take food, getting them to practice that. And then I'm going to start adding more behaviors in. So I might add maybe a sit and a wait, or I might add a touch and the dog touches my hand and then I toss the ball just so that I'm starting to build some of that, some of that um, self-control in there. And so I get their brains kind of turning on instead of turning off when, when those fetch items come out. So they might come back, I might start working on touch, sit, touch, yes, toss. So depending on, and again, if the, if the frustration starts to come up, if you start to see barking at you, if you start to see barking at the ball, if you start to see that they give up, if you start to see that they're just pouncing on the item, that just means that we're asking for a little bit too much too fast. So we just slow that down a little bit and start building in those behaviors under lower levels of arousal because however you're training and however you're practicing, if you're practicing under high levels of frustration, your dog might be able to quote, do it or um, successfully complete that, but we're building in that emotional state there and that's not the emotional state that we want here. Another game is tug of war. So this is actually a flirt lore. <laughs> so this is um, a sweet little girl, Doris, who's holding the other end of a flirt lore. So here's the toy on the other end. I, something I forgot to mention is that when we're playing with that flirt lore, we want to let them catch it often so that they feel successful. Tug of war is a really, really great way to get our dogs um, kind of playing and using their bodies. However we teach our dogs to play, whether it's really rough or really soft, that's how they might play going forward in the future. So it depends on kind of what you want your dog to be able to do. Some people really like to kind of roughhouse with their dogs with tug. It was a myth um, that kind of came out forever ago that said that you should not play tug with your dog. That's not something that we really subscribe to anymore. There's, there's not science that supports that at this point in time. So you might see some growling, you might see some, um, you know, some kind of high arousal stuff going on, but, but that's in play. So similarly to how we might kind of get vocal um, when, we're, when we're playing really intensely, very similar. So I want to let the dog kind of set the intensity too to tell me how they like to tug. So I let them sort of um, let me know, again, with their body language and their behavior, how they want to play. And I'll try to, to moderate myself to play how they enjoy it. And then I let them win a lot. So I want to make sure if we're just tugging and tugging and tugging and tugging and it's lasting forever, that dog might be getting tired. I've seen some dogs have pain in their mouth or their jaw and they really want to let go and they really want to take a little bit of a break, but it's hard because the competition has gotten kind of so high with that person and they really do want the item. So they keep playing. And that's something that, again, we kind of think about what physically and mentally that's doing to our dogs. It's much better to let go and then let them reinitiate over and over. And as soon as I let it go, I celebrate with them. So I'm like, good job, you did it. Good job, good dog, great. I wanna make sure that they feel successful and they feel excited that they've sort of won. Again, I wanna, I wanna be careful, but we'll talk a little bit about, imagine if you're playing, say, soccer with a toddler, you're the bigger one, you're the stronger one, you're more skilled at the game, you kind of know the tricks of the trade and how to get in fast and how to, how to um, get maybe the ball in the net really quickly. Of course, because you're the one who has, has kind of all the life skills that have built for those behaviors. If you won every single time, if you just every time won and you kicked it in and you were like, I did it, I did it, I'm the best at this game. Your play partner is not going to have very much fun, is not going to feel very successful, and is not likely to want to continue with you in the future, or you might see high levels of frustration and competition come up. So similar thing with our dogs. 
doing what we call self handicapping or the, the one who's bigger or stronger or kind of um, better at the game, moderating and going down and working at the level of that other individual is something in groups and social groups that really helps bring groups together so that everyone can play and everyone can have fun. So that's something that we just wanna think about. It's okay to let your dog win and it's, it's um, better to let them win frequently to keep them wanting to play the game than to have you quote win every time. So I really like to make sure that my dog feels successful and that they're having a good time. Short training sessions. I think sometimes when people think about training, they think it's gonna be this kind of exhausting, daunting task of pulling out your treats and getting all your stuff ready and training for an hour and then putting it away. And I just don't have time for that. What I like to do is I like to put it in places where naturally you're gonna have to do something with your dog that takes about that long anyway, or it's really easy for you. So maybe during a commercial or in between episodes in a show, or maybe when you're feeding breakfast or you're feeding dinner anyway, just spending maybe five minutes with that dog's kibble or some special treats and just doing a quick little training session. Something that I think that's a really big gift that our dogs give us is the ability to be present with them. So they really are sort of moment by moment. And I think it's really easy to just walk throughout our lives with our dogs and just kind of live around them. But when we stop and we take a few minutes and we just spend some time with them, our phones away, kind of everything away, and we just focus for maybe five minutes on them and listening to them and what's going on in the environment just kind of drifts away. And it's just us kind of working as a team that's really valuable, not just for them, but for us and for our relationship with them. So I really like kind of taking that time and, and really enjoying that gift that our dogs bring to us and spending just maybe five minutes working on behaviors, even that that dog knows. Maybe we don't have the ability at that time or we don't have kind of the mental capacity to teach a new skill. It's okay to just practice what that dog already knows. So Maybe you work on sit, down, stay, or you work on touch or spin or whatever it is that your dog knows. Just spending a couple minutes just practicing those things. Or maybe we're going to work on some new skills that that dog knows. I think something that is really easy to do is sort of start working on the skills in the environment that we want to use them. So we're sort of putting our dog to the test before they've had enough practice. So think of where you're going to work on loose leash walking. If the first time you work on loose leash walking is out in the real world around distractions and specifically if our dogs are reactive around their triggers, again, going back to the part of the brain that processes fight or flight is not going to be, um, or that's going to be affecting the part of the brain that's learning new skills. So it's going to be much harder for our reactive dogs to be able to practice some of those behaviors in the real world. So if I want them to use them, I'm sure as heck gonna practice over and over and over in the house where there are lower levels of stress because that's where I'm gonna get the most bang for my buck in terms of training because that fight or flight part of the brain is not online as much as it is when we're around the triggers. So if I'm practicing loose leash walking, I might just walk around my house during my five to 10 minute training session and just yes and feed my dog for following me loosely on the leash. Something that I like to do for people that are used to kind of pulling the leash back a lot is I will have them practice loose leash walking with no leash on. Just follow me around the house and then maybe I'll have a leash on, but it's really, really, really loose and it's hooked maybe to my belt and not to my hand so that I'm not pulling my dog back and forth. And it might be a little bit of a game where we say, can we walk around for five minutes without any tension on the belt? And so it's your job to kind of yes and feed fast enough to be able to keep the dog right by your side. And it's just a fun little game that doesn't take too much time or effort in terms of mentally doing things with your dog. If we want to add a physical aspect, we could have, say there's two people in your home back and forth, you can play recall. So one person says, come, and then the dog rushes over, gets a treat. The other person says, come, the dog rushes over, gets a treat, come, rushes over, gets a treat. We might teach them to walk really slowly up and down the stairs. This is something that um, if you try to walk really slow up or down the stairs, maybe try it next time. It takes a lot more effort than when you've got a lot of momentum going. So it's a really good way to sort of get our dogs to use their bodies. Maybe we just bring them up and down the stairs twice 
And that alone might be enough to kind of teach them how to slowly move and might be physically exhausting for them. Frozen Kong, so these are really great. So Kong is my favorite, um, my favorite brand out of all of the, the options that we have for these. They're really durable. There's multiple levels. So there are, there's a Puppy Kong that's really flexible. There's a red and then there's this black that's are really durable. So what we do here is we can take, we can really, it's just a little, um, almost like a little tube, holes on each side, and we basically fill it with anything we'd like to. So maybe a wet dry food mix, maybe some yogurt, cream cheese, handfuls of shredded cheese. What these are are just Kongs that we take, we stuff inside, and then we can put them in the freezer to let our dogs enjoy them later. I really like doing a little bit of food prep with our dogs. So I like doing maybe my day is Sunday where I just prep a good 14 Kongs so that I can pull them out and give them to my dogs throughout the day. I'm, it might replace their dinner one day. So I'll stuff it and I give them that for dinner. And it just gives me a good half an hour to an hour to just relax and know that my dog is getting something that's mentally enriching for them especially during those times that are really busy outside. So say my reactive dog is having a hard time relaxing in the house. This might be a good way to get them something to do for an extended period of time. Some dogs like this dog here does not like his Kong frozen because his sweet little self is cold all of the time. <laughs> so he likes his Kongs right out of the fridge. So for him, I put them in the fridge. And for my other dog that's sort of a speed eater and doesn't mind them being frozen, his go in the freezer. Homemade enrichment. So these are awesome. And my first note here is they are free. So I really like using any kind of recycling or any boxes that we have for homemade enrichment. We can use cereal boxes. We can use granola bar boxes. We can use any sort of box um, or newspaper, recycled newspaper. I collect the newspaper from all of my neighbors who really enjoy kind of getting some extra use out of them before they go recycle them. So what we do is we start again, remembering the level that our dog needs to be successful. I might start with taking a little piece of newspaper, putting some treats in and then balling it up in a little ball. I might start with um, maybe a toilet paper roll and I put some treats in, I close up one end and then I kind of leave the other end open so they just have to shred it apart. And then I might start getting really crafty as they're getting better, especially for our dogs that like to shred things. So our dogs that like to kind of pull stuffing out of toys, this can be a really fun one for them. And again, this, is, this can be their meal. So this can be breakfast, this can be dinner. I really like to do it during times where I'm gonna have to leave the house again because it's, it's using their brains, it's using their bodies, it's getting them engaged mentally and physically. So say I have a long day at work, I come home and I have to leave my dogs again. I, instead of kind of just leaving and feeling guilty and not you know kind of feeling bad for leaving the dog again, I'll make sure maybe I'll combine these where I'll give them one of these things to chew on. And then when I leave, I give them a Kong. So they're staying nice and busy for that period of time so that they're not in as much distress and they're not as um, kind of um, upset about that departure because they're mentally staying busy. So as the dog gets to be successful at these, I might even take my newspaper. I'm going to put maybe 10 piles of treats in different newspapers and then I scrunch them all up in little balls. So there's 10 little balls. And then I might take that and getting kind of to the other end of really difficult. I might take that and I might put those inside of cereal boxes. And then I might take that cereal box and put it inside of an Amazon box. And then I might take the Amazon box and go hide it and have the dog find it. So imagine how many different things your dog is having to do by all of these exercises being combined in one. I might even put a Kong in there. So I might take a Kong, put just a teeny little bit of maybe wet dry or wet food in there and then hide that inside of the box and then hide it. So there's all sorts of combinations that we can do to keep our dogs mentally and physically busy, especially for our dogs that the second they go outside, they're kind of searching for a trigger. I really like to do this where I'm having the dog search for something other than their trigger. So I might put this outside and I might have the dog start to find it outside. And it's just a really good way to get their brains, that seeking part of their brains that's looking for things, looking for something other than their triggers and looking for something that's fun for them. And then being able to complete that modal action pattern of, of destruction. 
I just want to take a little time here to just take a little note. People often worry here, well, is my dog going to destroy all the paper? Are they going to destroy all the boxes? Are they going to destroy everything they see? The answer is no, I have not seen that happen. So what I like to do, remember, sort of think about if you had a toddler, again, we're, we're being careful here, but we're going to use human examples just from an empathy and kind of understanding perspective from, from learning. So if we had a toddler who had markers and was coloring on the wall, this, what this does is say, here's paper, here's where you do that. So not here, but here, not on the wall, but on paper. That's where we do this activity. Of course, while the animal is learning or while the student is learning, we're not then leaving them with a bunch of markers to play with without supervision. We're gonna take those markers and put them up until that animal is skilled enough to know it's only for this specific activity when it's given to me in this specific context. So we're not just kind of free, free reign leaving them with these items all of the time. We're making sure that it's a very structured activity and the animal knows when it's happening and when it's not. So when done correctly, no big deal, you should not have a problem. Nose work games. So these are really fun. So we might take on a rainy day or on a busy day. I'm going to start off. These are little cones that I think they're like $10 for a pack of 100 on Amazon. They're, they're not very expensive. So these are like for sports. So you take these cones, you put them all over the place. I'll start by putting treats in all of them. And then the dog kind of picks up the cone, gets the treats out, goes to the next one, picks up the cone, gets the treats out. Some dogs will nudge them over. As they find them, I'm celebrating and I'm like, good dog, you did it, great job, great work. Um, making sure that that dog has a really good um, experience with that. And then I'm gonna start putting them in maybe uh, two thirds of them. And then I might start one third and I might start loading them up and having more in them. So I want them going from cone to cone. And as they go to pick up the empty one, it's kind of wasted energy. So then they start learning, oh, I'm going to sniff to find the ones that have the treats in them. And then we start getting that nose work game where they're starting to go from cone to cone to find which ones have treats and which ones don't. I might do this also with boxes. So I might just have a row of, um, of boxes that are open and maybe four of them have treats in them and the rest of them do not. So they're going from box to box to find which one has food in them. And if I really wanted to, again, I'm building these skills before I put them to the test here, but if I really wanted to work on it, what you can start to do if you wanna teach a calm nose work game is when they get to the one that has food, you immediately cue sit, the dog sits when they get there and then you yes and then pull the food out and give it to them or give them the whole box to, um, to get the food out themselves. So what we can do is we can teach them. So it's kind of that, um, that really advanced stuff where they go to the food. As soon as they find it, they sit down to indicate to you, I found it, it's right here. And then you've got a calm behavior instead of the dog just jumping in. But again, you have to have built some really good impulse control around food. You have to have a really nice sit. Um, all of that has to already be in place, but it's a really fun one. We can also do that with Tupperware containers. So putting little holes inside of Tupperware containers inside of the top and the dog is sniffing from container to container until they find the one. As soon as they find it, you can say the word, yes, pick it up, open up the lid and then give them the treats inside. If I wanna teach a calm wait, I will teach that calm right before. So as soon as they get to it, I cue sit, the dog sits, yes, and then I open it up and I give it to them. But these are really fun and we can add difficulty really easily. We can take and work in new locations. We can try outside, all sorts of ways that we can add difficulty to this. And remember, no matter what you're doing, reactivity does not limit the amount of fun that your dog can have. Maybe walks or the dog part aren't really the best for your dog, but that does not mean that your dog is limited in terms of what they can and cannot do and how much fun that they can have in their world. We just have to get a little bit more creative about kind of the ways that we exercise and how we interact with our dogs, but it does not mean that they are limited in any way, shape, or form. It just means that we modify a little bit. So go enjoy all the things there are to do, explore and learn together with your dog. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.